those of you that haven't been here, I've been teaching on how to receive God's best. And last night, I spent the whole time basically talking about that most people have settled for less than God's best. And that's not good. There's no way that you can receive God's best accidentally. You have to pursue it. And that's what I was encouraging us to do last night. And I also talked about that it's a matter of receiving it, not getting God to give it. God has already done it. It's just that we have to, first of all, desire the things of God, seek with all of our heart before we find it. And then we need to take our authority and release and receive what God has already done. Then this morning, I started contrasting two different ways that God can touch your life. One is through a miracle and one is through a blessing. And most Christians, especially spirit-filled Christians, <clears throat> just think, oh man, I want to see the miracles of God. Actually, it's better to receive from God by a blessing than it is a miracle. Because if you are going to have a miracle, you've got to have a crisis first. God does not supersede or suspend natural or spiritual laws unless there is a very good reason and it's a crisis reason. And I could go in scripture and show you crisis after crisis that this was the only time that miracles happen. You have to have a crisis first. So if you're going to live from miracle to miracle, you're going to live from crisis to crisis. That's not the way that God wants us to live. A blessing, on the other hand, will prevent crisis. For instance, which would you rather have? Would you rather be able to believe God and stand and confess the word and after two years of believing, somebody just gives you a new car? That would be awesome, right? Yeah. You know what's better? To be so blessed, if you want a new car, just go buy one. Pay cash for it and get it over with. It's one thing to believe for your needs to be supernaturally men. I talked about that this morning and for a period of time, Jamie and I had, it was my fault, not Jamie's, but we had to live off of miracles. But you know what? Now we live in the blessing of God. And I'd rather live under the blessing of God rather than to have to have a miracle every single day. And we had a lot of them. It's better not to even need a miracle. So a blessing will prevent a crisis. A miracle demands a crisis. A miracle is only temporary. A blessing, once it's given, is eternal. I'll minister on that tomorrow morning. And I tell you, that is something that will change your life if you can understand that. And also, a miracle is never as abundant as a blessing. A miracle is just going to be enough to get you by. And then you'll need another miracle. So I contrasted blessings as, and miracles as being two different ways of God being able to meet your need. And if you're in a situation where you need a miracle, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not putting miracles down. I'm actually trying to elevate blessings and say that God wants to bless you and provide so much for you that, you know, which would you rather have? The ability to get healed when something bad happens or to be so blessed that no plague comes nigh your dwelling and you never get sick. See, this is a new wrinkle in a lot of people's brains. They, they just say, well, you can't live that way. You can. The Bible talks about living in divine health so that no plague will come nigh your dwelling. You know, John G. Lake was a minister in the early 1900s. He actually was in part of the 1800s, 1900s. And John Lake saw great, great miracles happen. He had a school where he trained what he called practitioners, and he sent them out. And he told them, don't come back until they're healed. They didn't just pray for a person. They got them healed. And anyway, that's a whole other teaching. But he saw a lot of miracles happen. And they had a plague. I think it was the bubonic plague. I'm not sure. But uh, I think it was a bubonic plague. And he had actually shut down one hospital in Spokane, Washington, because so many people got healed. They had two hospitals. One was closed. Spokane, Washington was awarded the healthiest city in the United States for decades because John G. Lake's ministry was located there. He saw great miracles of healing and some tremendous things happen. And anyway, during this plague, he was helping the doctors because he, was, he saw more people healed than the doctor saw healed. So he was helping the doctors with this plague People were dying right and left, and they were putting, they had a makeshift morgue, I think, in a gymnasium. 
And anyway, a man just died, convulsed, foamed at the mouth and died. And one of the doctors looked over at John G. Lake and says, man, aren't you glad that we've got a vaccination, an inoculation against this? And John G. John G. Lake just looked at him and says, who's got an inoculation? And this doctor looked at him and says, you couldn't be helping these people with this plague. If you don't have an inoculation, you'll die. And John Lake said, no germ can touch my body and live. And this, this doctor, of course, didn't believe him. And so he says, I'll prove it to you. And he said, take one of those microscope slides, one of those little glass things. And he says, wipe that foam off this guy's mouth that just died. And they put it under a microscope and you could see all of the germs just moving. And John Lake said, watch this. And he just touched his finger to that spit on that slide and instantly everything was still. And some of you think you can't do that. That's what I want to teach you tonight is that this is one of the blessings spoken that no plague will come nigh your dwelling. There are examples like during the bubonic plague that swept the uh, Europe of, of a, one preacher that got up. And I mean thousands and millions of people were dying. And he stood at the edge of his town because that plague was just sweeping across Europe. And he stood there and said, in the name of Jesus, this plague cannot come in this town. Not a single person in that town got the plague. It went all around them. People think, well, why did God let that happen to everybody? God has given us the power to overcome these things that are on the earth. And if we don't use our power and understand and mix with faith, it says in Hebrews chapter four, verse two, that the word was preached unto them the same as it was, or preached unto us the same as it was preached unto them. But the word preached unto them did not profit them not being mixed with faith in those that heard it. You have to mix the word with faith. This isn't an amulet. This isn't magic. You don't just hold this under your arm and the miracle power of God flows. A lot of Christians really are kind of thinking like uh, vampires. You know, if you hold up the Bible or a cross, they just can't come near you. I think that's so stupid. <laughs> of course, vampires are stupid in the first place, but if there was such a thing as a vampire, I guarantee you he wouldn't cringe at the Bible or at a cross. The devil translated some of the Bibles. He's not afraid of the book. You got to mix faith with this to have its power. If it's not just holding the Bible under you or sticking it on your head, it's not going to release its power. You've got to mix faith with it. And most people have not mixed faith with what the word of God says. And so God has given us this so much power that no plague can come nigh your dwelling. That you can walk in supernatural blessing and see God's blessing come upon you and overtake you. And people think, well, if that's so, then why hasn't it happened? Because you aren't believing for it. We aren't shooting for God's best. We don't understand these things. Most people are living from miracle to miracle, crisis to crisis, instead of finding out about the blessings of God and the spiritual and the natural laws that control the blessings of God. And instead of getting in and cooperating with them, they're just doing things on their own. You know, in the, in the natural realm, people recognize that there are natural laws that you have to follow when you sow a crop. You can't just put the crop in the ground whenever you want to. You can't go out and plant your seed in the dead of winter. You got to wait until the soil starts warming up. There is a right and a wrong time to plant depending upon what you're growing. And then it takes time and you have to water it and you have to give it the right nutrients and different things can affect it. We recognize that in the natural realm, there are natural laws that affect how a crop produces. And all through the Bible, it says you sow and then you reap and you reap only what you sow. And the, that same analogy is used in the spiritual realm. And yet Christians just think, well, I prayed and I asked God to heal me. How come I'm not healed? Did you take the word of God and use it like a seed? It says in Proverbs chapter four, that God's word is health unto all of your flesh and life to them that find it. And yet a lot of people, well, I prayed and I asked God, did you take the word that produces health and sow it in your life like a seed? 
Are you cooperating with the spiritual laws? This morning I talked about honoring your parents causes long life. A joyful heart, merry heart does good like a medicine. Most people ignore those things and they just are living in strife. You know, the Bible says in, the, in uh, James chapter 3, verse 16, that where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. If you put that together with 1 Corinthians 14, I forget the exact verse, but it says God isn't the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all of the churches of the Lord. So if God isn't the author of confusion, guess who is? The devil. So you put that back with James 3, 16, where envy and in strife is, there is confusion. Or you could say there is the devil and every evil work. And people don't connect the dots. And they're living in anger. You get mad at the person that cuts you off in traffic and wave at him with one finger and wonder why, why can't I get healed? You know what? You are releasing the devil. Every time you get angry, Every time you curse the politician that you don't like and speak bad about people, every time you gripe and talk about people behind their back, every time you get in a fight at home, you are releasing the force of the devil. It's quiet in this Presbyterian church. <laughs> Many of you grew up with strife. You grew up, you know, you had the double standard. Out in public, you do one thing. But when you get home, man, you let your hair down and anything goes at home. And you wonder why you're having problems at home. You ought to treat people better in your own family than you treat a stranger out in public. You know, my brother, he lives over here in Austin. I went over and saw him on Tuesday. And when he first got married, it was just a few months after they were married, he came home from work and his wife had the crystal and the sterling silver out and the china and the table set. And he says, what's this for? And she says, we got company coming over. And he says, well, why did you put this? And I says, well, we put out our best for company. You know what my brother did? He got all that and put it up. And he says, from now on, we will use the china and the crystal and the serving sterling silver for our family. And we'll put the other stuff out for the other. He says, we're going to treat our family better than we treat anybody else. Yeah. That's a good deal. I like that. But most of us just have this, that you got to put on the dog. You got to show off when other people come around. And you know what? We say things to your mate that you would never say to me. I've been in people's homes before and stayed with them. And I've heard them yell at their child and say, get up there and clean up your room. You sorry thing, make your bed. And they just speak down to them. And then after everybody's off gone to school, they'll say, why am I having trouble with my kids? <laughs> and I've told them before, I said, talk to me the way you talk to your son and see how our relationship goes. <laughs> now that's not to say you don't ever make them do what they need to do, but you know what? We just have this double standard where we allow strife. Many of you grew up with it and you don't understand there are spiritual laws. And if you get into strife, envy and strife, there is the devil and every evil work. Not some of them, everyone. Cancer, sickness, poverty, divorce, strike, anything you want. You just turn the devil loose through your temper and through your selfishness. Come on now. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching good. There are spiritual laws. And most people see in the natural, you understand that you got to plant at a certain time. It takes time. You got to water it. And we understand, but in the spirit, we think, well, if God's God, God could just do anything. God is the one that created natural and spiritual laws. And he doesn't violate them easily. He saw all of them and said, it's good. And he doesn't want to give you a miracle. He would rather you start cooperating, take care of yourself in the natural and in the spiritual. Walk in love. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things would come upon you. Amen. He gave us guidelines and the problem is we just aren't following them. What I want to talk about tonight, I, I contrasted a blessing and miracle and I want to talk about what is a blessing tonight and help you to understand what a blessing is and how to receive it and how to activate it. 
And let me first of all make this point. This is really important that you get this. A blessing is not a thing. We will often look at our house and say, that's a blessing. Or this car and say, that's a blessing. Those aren't blessings. Those are the byproducts of a blessing. And the reason it's important for you to realize this is because physical things come and go. You can't control everything out here. You are going to have times where something happens. Like I remember when Jimmy Swaggart and um, Jim Baker went on trial and got exposed for their sins. Did you know that media ministries, my ministry took a 40 to 60% decrease in income when they did what they did? Because people just all of a sudden, fear hit them like, uh oh, all media ministries are crooks. And they began to start cutting their giving down. And I took a hit. Over 50% of our income left because I didn't do a blooming thing. It wasn't my fault. I didn't do anything. The same thing happens every time there's a hurricane. Did you know when uh, Hurricane Katrina hit, did you know that our income from this area went way down? Because people are occupied. They aren't watching the Christian program anymore. They're watching the news to see what's going on. And then they find out about people hurting and they divert their giving towards these benevolence things, which is okay. I'm not against that, but I'm just saying that our income took a hit from this area, from New Orleans and other places, because people were occupied with other things. There's things that can affect you that don't have anything to do with you. And if you think that, oh, the blessing of God is how much money I've got coming in or what kind of house I'm living in or what kind of clothes I'm wearing, if you think that that is the blessing of God, there are times that that will fluctuate and go up and down and then your faith will be affected. But it really helps to understand what the blessing of God really is. Here is a real simple definition of the blessing of God. It is God's divine favor spoken over you. <laughs> now I could spend a lot of time explaining that, but it has to be spoken over you. God has grace for everyone, but when you enter into covenant with him, he starts speaking things over you and he starts releasing his divine favor. And this is what the blessing is. Here's another way of saying it. Most people, you know, you remember that old story about the goose that laid the golden egg? Anybody remember that? Most people want the golden egg, but what's really valuable, the golden egg or the goose that lays the golden egg? You know what, a house or a car or money in the bank or something could be considered an asset. And some people look at that and say that's a blessing. But you know what's the real blessing is the favor of God that produced all of these material natural things. And once you understand this, then you don't hold and hoard these things that you've got. Because it doesn't matter if you lose everything you got, you still got the goose. You still got the Lord. You still got the Lord's favor on your life. And the real asset is the blessing, the spoken favor of God over you. And once you understand that and start mixing it with faith, you start a supernatural flow of God's blessing towards you that nothing can stop. I tell you, it'll, it's powerful. And you can come to a place where you're secure. Man, I could teach right here on Luke 16 about the rich man who complimented his servant who stole from him. And he, he was so detached from his things. His things were like walking out the door with his servant, and yet he was able to bless him. Not many people could do that because most people are looking at their things as the real asset. When the truth is, it's not the things, it's the favor of God that produces the things. And once you change from saying this is a blessing and that's a blessing and instead you say the real blessing is the fact that God is on my side. God has blessed me. God loves me and God is for me and you can strip me of everything I've got and I'll rise to the surface. I'll come back. Amen. We had a fire in 2002 out where we lived. It was a drought year and there was 144,000 acres burnt. It started eight miles from our house. It burned within one mile of our house and they evacuated all of our homes. And um, we were out of it for two weeks. And a lot of my neighbors were renting trucks and loading up all of their household goods and leaving because they were afraid that their house would burn down. 
And Jamie and I just prayed over our house and blessed it and spoke favor over it and said, we believe that it's protected. And as we were leaving, Jamie said, I agree with you and I believe that our house is blessed and that everything's going to be fine. But she says, you know, when it comes down to it, it's just stuff. She says, it wouldn't matter if we lost the whole thing. We had fun getting it. We'd have fun getting it back. It's just stuff. Man, that's a great attitude. And if you've ever seen our house, we got a lot of stuff. It would take one truck to move Jamie's knickknacks. And then another truck to move the rest of the house. I mean, this is our dream house. We designed it. We built it. And it's just full of stuff. But you know, it's just stuff. That's the right attitude. And yet there's a lot of people that hoard their stuff and they're afraid to give it away because they think that that is the real blessing of God. It's not. It's the favor of God that has been spoken over you that produces things that's the real blessing. So don't ever get your attention on things and think that this is how I'm blessed because things have a way of leaving, changing, breaking, growing old, needing to be replaced. You need to recognize it's the favor of God spoken over you that is the real blessing. And let me just share some important things here in Proverbs chapter 18 in verse 20. It says, a man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth and with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. You know, I hadn't got time to go through every one of these, but I've actually preached on this verse for an hour and gone through every individual word. Words are important. It's using symbolism and says, you'll be satisfied with the fruit of your mouth. Fruit, that's like you plant a seed and something grows up and you get fruit. In other words, these words that come out of your mouth produce fruit. If you would look at it, that every word you say is like spitting seeds. Every word that you say is like spitting a seed out your mouth. And it goes on in the next verse to say, death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Death and life. It didn't say death and life and a whole lot of stuff in the middle that doesn't matter. Just idle words, wasted words. Matter of fact, Jesus said this over in Matthew chapter 12 around verse 33, 35 somewhere. He said, every idle word that men speak, they will give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by your words, you shall be justified. And by your words, you shall be condemned. Most of us think words aren't really that important. We have to say things like, I really mean it. When Jesus said, let your yea be yea and your nay nay. But we say all kinds of things that we don't mean. We promise people things. Say, I'll be there at seven o'clock. You get there at 710. 715, they can count on you being late. Don't raise your hand. <laughs> but you know what? God is never late. If he says something, the whole universe depends upon him keeping his word. If he says something, he has to do it or the universe would self-destruct. Everything is held together by the power of his word. Hebrews chapter one, verse three. He never lies. He never misrepresents. So if you say you're going to be someplace at 7 and you get there at 701, you're ungodly. That word means not like God. If you say we're going to leave at 730 and you get out the door at 740, you're ungodly. I know somebody think, boy, that's, you're nitpicking. God loves you if you're ungodly. I'm just trying to convince you that you're ungodly, amen, but God loves you. I'm not trying to condemn you, but I'm saying death and life are in the power of the tongue. And you know what? When you say something and don't do it, you're releasing death. When you speak forth your fear, every time somebody says, how are you doing? And you say, oh, the doctor says I'm dying. The doctor says it's going to get worse. And you talk about how you feel. You just made your situation worse. Death and life, not anything else. It's either death 
or life. You are either going to release life. You're spitting seeds that are going to produce something that grows positive in your life or you're speaking negative. I guarantee you, brothers and sisters, if I could follow you home and listen to some of you talk and then play it back for you, you shouldn't wonder why your life is in the mess that it is. Some of the things we say, some of the thoughts, and you know, not only the words you say out of your mouth, but as you think, your self-talk will eventually come out. And there are some of you that if you were around me, if I was home with you, you'd be on your best behavior. You'd say, oh, I believe it's getting better. I believe God's working in my behalf. But then you get around some people that don't believe like I do and they say, how are you? And you just ugh, let it all out. <laughs> just throw up all over them, all of your doubt and your unbelief. You're releasing death. You're spitting seeds of death that are gonna produce something every time you do that. And remember that a blessing is nothing but God's divine favor spoken over you. The reason I bring this out is to say, if your words and my words are life and death, every word, and let me put a little parenthesis here before I finish that statement. But that's not only true of your words, that's true of every word you listen to. If you watch a show and they're speaking things contrary to the word of God, they're speaking death into you that's impacting you and having an impact on you. When they speak strife, did you know where envying and strife is? There's confusion in every evil work. And every time you watch a show with strife and hatred in it and people hurting each other, did you know you are opening up a door through their words of putting death in your life. Every time you listen to a song, country and western, somebody running off with another person's wife and sitting on the bar stool and complaining about your pickup and your dog leaving and the Wichita line man still on the line, you're sowing seeds of death and discouragement on the inside of you. Every time you hear somebody sing about lusting after this person and going to a bar and and doing what, I don't know what they are, but all of these songs and stuff, you know what? You're sowing seeds of lust on the inside of you. I know some of you don't like this because it doesn't fit your lifestyle, but I think if you'd be honest, your lifestyle isn't working. <laughs> you're sick, you're poor, you're stressed. You know that there's something more than what you've got. And yet when somebody goes to telling you the truth, well, I'm not sure I agree with that. You know, if what, you, if what you're doing isn't working for you, why don't you listen to somebody that it is working for? Amen. You need to consider what I say. It's important the words that you say, not only the words you say, but the words everybody. And if it's important, the words that we say, and if this be true, that death and life are in the power of our tongue, just think how powerful God's words are. When God speaks something over you, it's powerful. And I think that we lose some of the impact of this because we live in a society where our words don't mean that much. Used to, if you gave somebody your word, you could count on it. You could count on it. Nowadays, you can sign a contract, and a contract doesn't mean anything. If you get a good lawyer, he can get you out of it. Depends on what the definition of is, is. <laughs> People don't mean what they say. They, you know, they, they wanted to put some of these recent presidents on Mount Rushmore. But they, they decided they didn't have room for two more faces. You'll get that later. I mean, politicians today, they just lie. And it's part of the territory. And because of this, we don't think there's that much power in words. But God, it says in Psalms chapter 89, verse 34, he says, my covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that has gone forth out of my lips. You meditate on that verse and what he's saying is every time I say something, it's a covenant. It's a contract. God never lies. God never says I'll do something and doesn't come through with it. 
And that verse that I quoted earlier out of Hebrews chapter one, verse three, it says that Jesus is the express image of his person and the brightness of his glory and um, upholding all things by the word of his power. He upholds everything by the word of his power. You know, over in Genesis, if you were to turn over there, there's like 10, 15 times that God said, let there be light. And there was light. God created everything tangible that you and I can see out of words. Words are the parent force. You were created by words. This earth, the oxygen you breathe were created by words. That body was created by words. It will respond to words. Words are the parent force. Words created everything. And according to that verse in Hebrews chapter one, verse three, he holds all things together by the power of his word. <clears throat> Do you know, if you look at an atom, they say that there's a nucleus with like charged particles. And according to every law of physics that we know, these like charged particles repel each other. The nucleus should be flying apart and yet it's compacted and held together so tightly that we've only been able to split a few unstable atoms, uranium, plutonium, and some things like that. But in a slice of bread, I have read that there is enough energy in the atoms of one slice of white bread to power an ocean liner across the Atlantic Ocean and back. There's all of this power located in the atoms, but you know what? We can't split them. They should be flying apart by everything we understand, but something is holding them together. You know what it is? It's the word of God. He told them, he created them, he spoke, and the word of God holds the entire universe together. And if God ever broke his word, if he ever said he'd do something and failed to do it, the universe would self-destruct. You and I would self-destruct. The whole thing would go up in smoke. As long as we still have the earth intact, it shows that God has never broken his word. When God says something, it's a covenant and he will not break it. He won't alter the thing that has gone forth out of his lips. And there is life and death in the words of God. And a blessing is when he speaks life. And it has supernatural power in it. And yet most people, again, we don't honor words. We don't honor our word. We don't honor the word of other people. And so we forget that God has all of this integrity. And when he says something, so we read these scriptures and it says things like no plague will come nigh our dwelling. And we think, oh, well, wouldn't that be wonderful if that happened? He just said it over you. This is a blessing. It's spoken and life is in that. And the only thing that keeps that life from coming to pass is our lack of faith. Again, Hebrews chapter four, verse two says the word preached unto us was also preached unto them, but it didn't profit them because it wasn't mixed with faith in them that heard it. God has spoken all of these blessings over us, brothers and sisters. We should be the head only and not the tail, above only and not beneath. Amen. And yet you walk up to the average Christian, how are you doing? Well, okay, under the circumstances. You ought to get out from under there. <laughs> you ought to be above only and not beneath. You ought to start taking the word of God and say, I am blessed with all spiritual blessings, that man, I am highly favored. When Mary went to see Elizabeth, she was filled with the Holy Ghost and John the Baptist leapt in her womb and out of prophecy, she didn't know what happened. Mary didn't call her on her cell phone or send her an email. She didn't know what had happened and without knowing anything in the natural, she started prophesying, saying, blessed is the uh, mother of the Lord, highly favored. You are blessed among all women. Did you know that that word that was used there when it says you are blessed among all women, you're highly favored. It was only used twice in the Bible. Once when Elizabeth spoke that over Mary and the other time is in Ephesians chapter one, verse six, where it says that you have been blessed. You are highly favored. You are accepted in the beloved is the way it's translated in Ephesians one, six. You have, you have the exact same favor on you that was on Mary, the mother of Jesus. You are blessed, 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 blessed. Yes, yes, 
And yet we haven't accepted it and seen the manifestation of it because we haven't received it. We haven't understood this. Most people don't think about the power of a blessing. Our Western culture doesn't think this way. But you know, in the Eastern culture, the words that you say are very important. And this is the culture that the Bible was written from. And when people said things, I mean, it was a covenant. They would have a blood covenant. They would strike a covenant and enter into covenant. And those covenants were binding. People would die over a covenant. Every time you say something out of your mouth, you're speaking a covenant. You may not know it, but you are releasing either life or death. It says over in Romans chapter 12, I forget the exact verse, but it says, bless and curse not. He told us to bless. Let me just turn over here. I've got it marked. In Romans chapter 12 and in verse, uh, in verse 14, bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. You know why he told you to bless? Because you can bless. You know why he told you not to curse? Because you also curse. Some of you think, oh, I don't curse anybody. Every time you look at somebody and say, they'll never make it. You've cursed them. Every time you say, boy, that person, they, they just are rotten. I, they aren't going to make it. I, you know, I think they're going to die. I don't think they're ever going to get out of these financial bind. You know what? You're releasing a curse. You may not understand that, but it's absolutely true. Some of you are cursed when you were a child. Your parents told you you'd never amount to anything. They'd say, I'm proud of your brother or sister, but you know what? You just, you just don't have it. You know what? They spoke curses over you. It's like a prophecy. And the sad thing is, it'll come to pass unless you cancel it. It says over in Proverbs chapter 26, I believe it is, verse 2 or 3, or maybe, I don't know, it's right there close. Matter of fact, I'm over here in Proverbs. Let me just turn over and look this up so I don't misquote it. In Proverbs chapter 26, verse 2, As the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. There are curses out here in the world, but you know what? You can negate them if you don't submit to them. You have to yield to them. You know, people curse me all of the time. We've got hundreds of blogs written against me. One of them says, the most dangerous man in America. <laughs> and I have people say terrible things about me and accuse me of things and stuff. But you know what? It can't affect me unless I yield to it, unless I mix it with faith unless I somehow or another empower it by worrying about it or thinking about it. The curse causeless will not come. But the sad thing is many of us have had people in positions of authority like parents or somebody or a teacher say, you'll never make it. You can't do it. And um, you know what? Many people let that become a curse, just like a governor in your life that hinders you and and it has power in it. Words have power. You may not have sat down and thought about it this way, but every person in here has had somebody say something to you that's hurt you and that has hindered you. Many of you have gone through a marriage, divorce or something, and you've had words spoken over you and you've never gotten over those words. Many of you have had somebody reject you. Many of you have had problems in home or business or Maybe you've had a failure and people have spoken things about you and your life is still bound by those words. There's power in words. You can break that curse. And one of the ways you break it is to recognize the greatness of a blessing over a curse. But you're going to have to start putting importance on words. You're going to have to start recognizing that if death and life are in the power of our tongue and he told us to bless and not curse, then what must it be like when God says something over you? Like no plague will come nigh your dwelling. He'll give his angels charge over you. You will not dash your foot against a stone. His angels will protect you. And on and on and on it goes. If we would quit transposing our culture and our unbelief about words onto God, but instead go back and study the word the way it's written, and see what God says, that he never violates his word. 
the whole universe is held together by the integrity of his words, then go through and look at this like a legal document. And if he said something good about you, man, that's it. He will never break this. This is what God says about me. By his stripes, I was healed. That's a blessing that God has put over us. That we will be above only and not beneath the head and not the tail. We will lend unto many nations, but we shall not borrow. They'll come out against me one way and flee seven ways. Man, I am going to prosper, prosper, prosper. These blessings will come upon me and overtake me. But you got to believe it. You got to understand the power of a blessing. You know, over in Genesis chapter one, let me just read a few of these verses to you about where God created the heavens and the earth. And look at this in Genesis chapter one, verse three, and God said, let there be light. Boom. And there was light. You know, this is really interesting. It was the third day before he created the sun. He created light three days before there was a source for the light to come from. We just can't wrap our brain around that. We would have created the sun first and then say, let there be light. But he created light and then created some place for it to come from. Romans chapter four, verse 17 says, God calls those things that be not as though they were. But he spoke light into existence. And then it says in verse six, and God said, let there be a firmament. And he created the heavens and the sky. In verse 9, God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place. And he created the dry land. In verse 11, God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed. You know, I wish I had time to go through every one of these verses. But if you'll just look at this 11th verse, it says, let the earth bring forth uh, grass, the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so, you know, that's real wordy and people read this in the King James and they just think, you know, they just talked weird back then. There's a reason for saying it this way. If he had just said, let there be grass, let there be herbs, let there be trees. Then when that tree died, he had had to create new trees. But he said, let there be herbs that have seed in themselves that can reproduce. He was creating with words the ability to procreate. And because of this, he's never had to create another tree. He's never created another animal. He's never created another everything. He created everything so perfectly and then he rested because it was over. He spoke things. His words are important. There's reasons he said, let the earth bring forth herbs that, whose seed is in itself, who can produce another tree. Man, it's so important, words. There's power in these words. And so then down in verse um, 14, God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven. And he created all of the stars and stuff. In verse 20, and God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly. And he created all of the creatures that live in the sea. In verse 22, it says, and God blessed them saying, notice that the way you release a blessing is by words. And here's what he said to these living creatures. He says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let the fowl multiply in the earth. You know why animals are able to reproduce? Because God said they could. He blessed them, spoke favor over them. Scientists will say that they've created life. Scientists have never created life. They can take a, a cell that already has God's life in it and they can clone it. They can separate it and start the reproduction thing, but they can't create life. One of the definitions of true life is something has to be able to procreate, reproduce. If it can't reproduce, it's not life. Scientists have never created anything that's able to reproduce. They can't do it because you know why it had the ability to reproduce? Because God said, be fruitful and multiply. And he hasn't said that to anything that a man's created. Life comes from God. It came through a blessing. Life as we know it didn't happen by some big bang or lightning striping, striking a pool of, of uh, what do they call it, slime or amino acids and Boy, if you believe that, I got a bridge I'd love to sell you. 
Anyway, I don't want to get off the subject, but it's God's the source of life. God said you live, you produce life. He created it and it came by his words. And these same words that spoke everything physical, you and me and everything in existence into life, those same words are spoken all throughout the Bible that all it takes is your faith to release the power that's in that and start understanding the power of a blessing. Down in verse 24, and God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature. And he created all of the animals that move upon the earth and he blessed them and told them to be fruitful and multiply. In verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And God created us by words. And in verse 26, God blessed them. And God said, this is how a blessing is released, is by words. You have to speak it into existence. He spoke the blessing of God. So the point I'm trying to get across is anything that God has ever said that is positive for you is a blessing. Amen. And all it takes is for you to put faith in that to release this power and start receiving it. You know, for time's sake, let me just refer to this, but over in the 27th chapter of the book of Genesis, well, let me back up just a little bit. In the 12th chapter is where Abraham came on the scene and God told him in Genesis chapter uh, 12, verse two, he says, I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. Now that he didn't bless him at that exact moment. He said, I will bless you. And as you go on through the life of Abraham, God just kept increasing it, saying every place that the sole of your foot treads upon, I'm giving it to you. If you can count the stars in the sky, number the grains of sand on your seashore, so shall your seed be. All families of the earth will be blessed in you. That was a reference to his seed, Jesus coming and redeeming the entire earth. And God just kept speaking positive things over Abraham and because of it, Abraham started out with nothing and became one of the wealthiest men of his day, so much so that kings came out and said, depart, your wealth is greater than our entire nation because God spoke things over him. And then when God gave him his seed, Isaac, and in the 22nd chapter, he went to uh, offer Isaac. God said, you know, offer Isaac as a sacrifice unto me. And Abraham was willing to do it. He actually lifted the knife and God stopped him. An angel stopped him and there was a ram caught by his horns in the thicket. And God gave him that as a sacrifice. And then the Lord told him, he says, you know, from this time forth, now I know that, man, you love me, you honor me, and you didn't hold anything back from me. And in blessing, I will bless you. You know, that's wordy to us and it doesn't mean anything, but God says, man, there is no end to the positive things I'm going to say over you. And God started blessing him and blessing his seed. And then in the 27th chapter of the book of Genesis, his uh, grandchildren, Isaac's children, uh, were born and uh, they were twins. And in the womb, there was this conflict going on between these two kids. They were fighting even in the mother's womb. And so Rebecca prayed and asked the Lord, what's going on? And the Lord told her, says, there's two nations in you. And the elder is going to serve the younger. He passed the blessing on in, Genesis, in Galatians chapter 4. It says that this was a symbol and type of how it's not by your human effort. It's the grace of God that causes everything to happen. And he was illustrating that through these two children. And so he made Esau the older servant to the younger and Rebecca believed him and she always honored Jacob, but Isaac actually liked Esau better and tried to pass the birthright on to him and the blessing of Abraham on to Esau. So the 27th chapter of the book of Genesis is where Isaac, he was old. He was about 110 years old. He actually lived to be 140 something. So he was very premature on this, but he says, I'm about to die and I can't see anymore. And he says, he said to his son Esau, go get me venison and make me that meal that I love and come in and let me eat it 
and then my soul is going to bless you. <coughs> and Rebekah was in the house when Isaac told his son Esau that. And she always favored Jacob, and she knew what God had spoken to her, that the elder was going to serve the younger. So Rebekah went and got Jacob and told him what Isaac had told Esau and says, hurry, go get me two lamb out of the flock and I'll kill them and I'll make this food that your father likes and you go in and you pretend to be Esau and you steal his blessing from him. And Jacob says, well, what happens if he recognizes that it's not me? He was blind, he couldn't see him, but you know, he says, what if he tells by my voice or something that I'm not Esau? And she says, look, I'm gonna put the skin of the kids upon your hands and upon your arms and on the back of your neck so that if he feels you, you'll feel like your brother Esau. That was one hairy guy <laughs> to have a fleece feel like him. And she also said, I'll give you his clothes so that you'll smell like him. Apparently, he was quite the fashion statement, amen. <laughs> and so anyway, they did this. And finally, Rebecca told him, says, look, if he finds out your curse will come upon me, I'll accept your curse for you. But that's how much she wanted him to get the blessing. And so Jacob did all of this and he went in and lied to his father and deceived him. His father felt him and he says, well, the voice is Jacob's, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And so he blessed him in the 27th chapter of the book of Genesis. Here's my point. How many of you would have fought with your siblings when you left home to get your father's blessing. See, we don't think that way. There are many of you that when it was time to go, maybe your parents didn't agree and you said, who cares what you think? You're gone. You didn't think about getting a blessing. We don't think this way. It's not a big deal in our Western culture, but in the Bible, which we ought to conform our culture to the Bible, not the other way around. In the Bible, the blessing of the parent was super, super, super important. Even God the Father spoke a blessing over his son when he came and got baptized. And he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And Jesus hadn't done a single miracle. The Father spoke a blessing over him. You may not have been taught this, but I tell you, blessings are powerful. And especially coming from God. But these two boys were willing to fight. And when Esau found out that Jacob had stolen his blessing, he wanted to kill him. I mean, it was a contentious thing. What, the reason I bring this out is to show you that a blessing is powerful. We may not think that way, but that's because our thinking is wrong. We need to conform ourselves to the word. The word says death and life are in the power of your words. And when Esau finally came in and said, Father, here's the food, rise up and eat it so that you can bless me. Isaac said, who are you? And he said, I'm Esau, your firstborn. And he said, he says, Jacob came and stole away your blessing. And then Esau began to cry. It said he lifted up his voice and wailed and says, don't you have a blessing for me? And he said, I have already blessed your brother and I can't change it. He is blessed. He will be blessed. And then in the next chapter, the 28th chapter is where Jacob had this experience and he had a dream with a ladder going up to heaven and God was at the top of the ladder and God spoke to him and placed the blessing of Abraham on him. He didn't have to lie and steal and cheat to get it. He got it in the next chapter in a vision between him and God. But the reason I bring all this out is to show how much they believed in the power of a blessing. I tell you, brothers and sisters, we need to change the way we think because most of us don't see it this way. But if you understood this and you started taking this as this is a list of all of the blessings that God has spoken over us. Deuteronomy 28 is 14 verses of blessings that you're blessed coming in, you're blessed going out. You're above only, you're not beneath. You're the head and you're not the tail. Psalms chapter 91 is all of the blessings that'll come over us. And there's just blessing after blessing written all through here. We need to start understanding this and saying, Father, you said this. You bless me and start putting importance in words. 
You know, when the Lord was first showing me this, it's been 20-something years ago, there was a man in our church, his name was uh, Ralph, and he was a greeter at our church. And he was kind of a short guy. He was about 70 years old, but he was just a happy guy. He loved everybody, and every person that came in, he would hug them. One time we had a bunch of hell's angels come to our church. There was about 15 or 20 of them. And there was this big old guy, must have weighed 300 pounds. Ralph couldn't have been over 120 or 30. And he walks up and sees this huge biker with nothing but a vest on, tattoos all over and no shirt underneath his vest. And he looked up at this guy and he says, well, everybody's got to go sometime. And he just reached up and hugged him. <laughs> told this guy, glad you're here. He went down front, came forward, and got born again in the service. Turned out he was on the FBI's 10 most wanted list for murder or something. Ralph nearly passed out when he found out. <laughs> but anyway, Ralph was just this guy. He was a great guy. And he was gone from church three weeks in a row. And I found out he had been sick. And then the next week I came back, he wasn't there. And finally the third week he wasn't there. And I just felt impressed to go over and minister to him. Turned out he had had pneumonia. He had been in the hospital, and they had let him out of the hospital, but he still had all of this phlegm that was in his chest, and he could barely breathe. He could hardly stand up and walk from the table to the bathroom or something because he, he just didn't have any lung capacity. He was full of all of this stuff. And so anyway, I went over to talk to him, and he says, Man, I just don't understand it. I know it's God's will for me to be healed. I've prayed. I've gotten better, but he says it just is hanging on. And this was when the Lord was showing me the power of a blessing. And death and life are in the power of the tongue. And I said, Ralph, I'm going to pray over you. And what I did was cut my hands like this, and I put my mouth down to his chest. And I started talking to his chest based on uh, Mark chapter 11, verse 23. Say to your mountain, be removed. Don't talk to God about your mountain, but talk to your mountain about God. Instead of asking God to do it as if you have no authority and power, take your power and reckon it. Man, I wish I had the words to make this clear to you, but there is death and life in the power of your tongue. Your tongue is a powerful weapon if it's mixed with faith. The problem is we speak so many foolish, idle words, we don't even believe our words. But if you can understand this and retrain yourself, there is life in your words. Raising from the dead power in your words. And so I cut my hands over his chest and I spoke and I said, lungs in the name of Jesus, I command you to be healed. I command all of this phlegm that's in his lungs to loosen and to come out of there now. And I blessed him and I cursed the pneumonia and said, you're dead. Cursed it, death and life are in the power of the tongue. I cursed the sickness, spoke life over him. And did you know while I was praying, he had to push me away because he started coughing and he went and got a towel. And I mean, in 10 minutes, he coughed up all of this junk out of his lungs and he was normal in 10 minutes time. He had been dealing with that for three weeks. But there's power in your words if you believe it. The problem is we've, con we've confused our own heart. You stand there and say, in the name of Jesus, I'm healed. And your heart thinks, is he kidding about this one the way he is about everything else? Is this like I'm going to be there at 7 o'clock and that means 7.30? What makes these words different than any other words? But you can get to a place where you believe the words you say. You don't say anything. <laughs> you know... If you want me, if you want a compliment from me, you, you probably shouldn't come fishing for one. I've had women come up before and say, do you think this dress makes me look fat? They just shouldn't ask me things like that. <laughs> I am at least kind enough to say, uh, you know, that's really not my expertise. You don't want my opinion. But if they press, I'm like, oh, Honest Abe in that Geico commercial about, well, maybe... <laughs> No, I'm not going to sit there and tell you a lie. Man, it confuses my heart. It says in Mark 11, 23, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith 
shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. If you believe in the power of your words, they will come to pass. But if you don't believe in the power of your words, they won't come to pass. That's the only thing that keeps you from falling over dead when you say, oh, that tickled me to death. You didn't believe it. You were just speaking idle words, but it's still negative. You just spit out some seeds. You have a culture of death and negativism. When you say something like, if I wash my car, I know it'll rain. You know what you're saying? I'm not blessed. Nothing works right for me. If I wash my car, the day I wash my car, it'll rain. I'm cursed. When you say nobody, you know, if anybody wins anything, it won't be me. I never win anything. I'll, I'll, I'm never the one that prospers. I, you know what you're doing? You're cursing yourself every time you do that. That's right. You need to get to a place where you start understanding the power of words and you start using your words to bless and curse not. Not only other people, but bless yourself. Speak to yourself and say, body, you are healthy in the name of Jesus. Body, you function properly. Most people don't speak what they want to have, they speak what they have. But again, Mark eleven twenty three says, whosoever, that means in the Greek, it means whosoever. It means anybody in here, any person in here, whosoever shall say, that's talking about your words with your mouth to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith, there's words again, will come to pass. He will have whatsoever he saith. You got to believe that the words you speak come to pass. And every time you say something and don't bring it to pass, you are confusing your heart. You know, there's a woman that put out a book, uh, something about who switched off my brain and basically that book is saying that your body listens to your words. And if you have toxic thoughts that are expressed through toxic words, your body starts bringing those things to pass. And I forget the exact statistics, but in this thing, it's a scientific book. And it's talking about that your brain communicates with every cell in your body billions of times a day. There is constant communication going on. And when you start thinking and talking negative, it, it releases that negative thought and feeling throughout your entire body. You can start speaking that, man, I'm really tired. Boy, I feel bad. And you know what? Your body will go to shutting down and getting ready to rest. You can go talking about, man, I have pain everywhere. And your body will start searching and amplifying pain. Or you could start speaking life and say, in the name of Jesus, I have it. Like again, that verse, Mark eleven twenty three, 23, it says you will have what you say. Most people are saying what they have when the Bible says you can have what you will say. So either speak what you have or have what you say. You can use your tongue to fight the devil. You can use your body to resist sickness and disease and poverty. And yet most people don't have this concept that I've talked about tonight, about the power of words, especially the power of God's word spoken over us. And so we hear these things, but we don't mix it with faith. And we just think that God's words are like our words. Maybe that only applies to some people. Maybe he didn't mean it today. Maybe it doesn't always work. But boy, when God has spoken a blessing over you, nothing can reverse it. Nothing from the devil, nothing in the natural. You're the only one that can stop the blessing that has been spoken over you from coming to pass. And that's through your unbelief. But if you would get into the word and begin to start understanding the power of a blessing, find the things that are written about you. With long life will I satisfy you and show you my salvation. You go and you take these things. And if, it, if God spoke it over somebody, it says Abraham's blessings are ours. Galatians chapter 3, verse 12 and 13. So anything that Abraham was blessed with, 
I've got those blessings. That's not talking about things. I don't want his 4,000 year old dead cattle and rotten tents. But I want that blessing, the divine favor of God that was spoken over him to where anything that he touches is blessed. That you will have favor. You will be a blessing. Those things have been spoken over me because Abraham's blessings are mine. That the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through faith. Galatians 3.13. Then you go to scriptures like this, you find this and you start speaking this and you train yourself that I believe what I'm saying. I'm releasing life instead of death. And you start blessing people. You know, most people don't know what I'm doing, but when I pray over people, I do this. I speak and I say, body, you are healed. You are blessed. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Sickness, you are dead. I curse you, cancer. I command you to die. Proverbs 18, 21, death and life. I use death against sickness and disease. And I use my tongue to speak that you're healed. Body, you are recovering. You know, sometimes I talked to one woman tonight who had arthritis. And she says, I've already understood. I believe I don't really need you to pray. I'm believing that I've received. But you could tell that her hands were still gnarled. But she had faith. She was believing. And I told her, I said, you know what I believe happened? You got rid of arthritis. You got rid of the demon. You don't have arthritis. But now you got all of the effects that arthritis has done to you. And you, most people don't understand this. You not only need to drive out the sickness, but you need your body to recover from the damage that sickness did to you. It's like when Jesus rebuked the wind and then commanded the sea to be still. He rebuked the source of all of the agitation and the high waves, but then he didn't wait on things to just calm down naturally. He took his words and said, peace, be still, and boom, instantly the sea was still. You gotta do both. You not only gotta curse cancer and command it to die, but now cancer is eating up part of your body. Start using your tongue and bless your body and say, appetite, you are coming back. Man, I'm not toxic anymore. I am feeling well. You speak life over yourself. You go to blessing yourself. And when somebody says, how are you? Don't say, oh man, I thought doctor told me I've got a one in 100% you know, chance of living. Don't curse yourself with your tongue. Some of you, well, I'm just trying to be honest. Forgive me for being blunt, but that's just stupid. (laughs) You got death and life and the power of your tongue. Why would you speak forth the negative? I'm not saying that you deny that it exists, but you just always speak forth the life. Don't emphasize the negative. You know, Jesus, when he went to raise Lazarus from the dead, the 11th chapter of the book of John, he... Uh, they told him that Lazarus was sick and he waited two days and then he told his disciples, he says, let's go back into Judea so that I may, our friend Lazarus is asleep, but I'm going to go awaken him out of sleep. You know, this is just andeology. I believe Jesus completely understood the power of words. He's the one that spoke everything into existence. He knew that the word death, dead, would cause fear, finality, unbelief. So he didn't use the word dead because... The way we use dead, it's like it's the end. But all dead is, is just you leave this realm and you go into another realm. It's not final. And anyway, Jesus didn't want to say dead because it would cause fear and doubt and unbelief. So he used the word sleep. But his disciples said, well, he's been sick. If he's sleeping, he'll do well. They didn't understand what he was talking about. So finally, Jesus said, our friend Lazarus is dead. He didn't deny what was actual, but he just, but he went on and countered it. He says, but I go that I am going to raise him up. I'm the resurrection and the life. He didn't just say a negative, but he spoke the negative and immediately countered it with what he was going to do. So if you, I think it's better not to even speak forth all of your hurts and fears and pains. Don't even speak death at all. But if somebody misunderstands, here you are looking green. And they say, boy, you look bad. Instead of saying, no, I don't look bad. I'm healed in the name of Jesus. An unbeliever might not understand that. So you could say something like, well, I know what I look like, but 
by the stripes of Jesus, I am healed and turn it around. So it's not totally wrong to speak what you feel. It just depends on where you put your butt. (laughs) If you say, well, the Bible says I'm healed, but I really feel bad. That's not good. But if you say, you know, I may not feel good and I got a bad report from the doctor, but in the name of Jesus, I am healed. Resurrection life is in this body and my body is recovering. If you do it that way, that's okay. So I'm not telling you to stick your head in the sand and act like you don't have problems. That's not what I'm talking about. But I am saying that we ought to use our words to speak life. And the words, your words are powerful. But if you can find the promises of God, the spoken favor of God over you and go to speaking them out of your mouth and get to a place to where you believe that the words you speak come to pass then I guarantee you, it is limitless what God can do in your life. But our unbelief, our idle words that we speak, the negative things that we speak when you don't even want it, and yet you say these rotten things, you're going to have to start bridling your tongue. James chapter 3 talks about a perfect man. It says a person who can bridle their tongue is a perfect man. Your tongue is like a fire. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. And it sets on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. Your words are important. Every word you listen to is important. If you would start living by this and then say what you mean and follow it up, then you could take that faith and put it in what God's word would say. Start speaking the word of God over yourself. Nobody's words influence you as much as your words. That's the reason that even if you don't feel healed, you ought to go to saying in the name of Jesus, I am healed. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And when you say it out your mouth, it'll come back around into your ears and go back down and it'll start growing and multiplying. And you need to speak the word of God over yourself. You need to bless yourself. You need to bless your business. And brothers and sisters, I just know that there's a lot of people that during this quote unquote recession, I don't even believe there is a recession. Anyway, I haven't got time to debate that. But there are people, Christians speaking, oh, it's hard. Everybody's suffering. You're speaking death. You're cursing your own business. You know, in Colorado Springs, I forget how many, there's like 200 parachurch ministries or something. And when the quote unquote recession hit, man, there was dozens that we had access to, to find out what they're doing. And most of them, when their income was still up, there was zero evidence of anything. They planned on a 20% reduction in the pre in the next year. They were anticipating the Bible says, make no provision for the flesh. They made provision for the flesh. They expected a recession and they got it. There's not a single one that I'm aware of that did that, that didn't have their income to go down. And ours went up in 2009. What was it? 23, 25%. We just chose not to participate in a recession. Amen. I'm just not participating. I still speak the blessing of God over us. And brothers and sisters, you can use, there's power in your tongue. And some of you think, I I just don't believe this. That's the reason it doesn't work for you. (laughs) When my wife and I were really going through some of these hard times, we'd go over to my mother's house and she would keep us alive. She'd feed us when I'd go over there and mow her lawn. And that kept us going. And I remember we had 23 pecan trees in our yard where I grew up. And when my dad died, she quit taking care of them. There were bag worms. She hadn't fertilized them. And we used to get four or 500 pounds of pecans. We got 50 the year before because my mother just let these trees go. And so I was mowing her yard and I was so thankful that she's keeping us alive. She didn't know it. She didn't know how bad we were, but I said, God, I'd like to do something. And I just took my words and I started blessing her. And I went around and every time I mowed around one of those trees, I'd lay hands on it and bless it and speak to it. I didn't fertilize them. I didn't go and 
do all of the things to trim them and everything it needed. And did you know that that fall, we had over 600 pounds of pecans out of those trees because I walked around them and spoke to them. And some of you are thinking, well, you arrogant thing to think that your words do that. Well, of course I believe it's my words, amen. It's what the word said. So you think you can speak and say, things? certainly I do. Don't you? I'm not the weird one. If you don't believe this, you're weird. You may be normal by, you know, society standards, but according to the word of God, you're the one that doesn't believe that the words you say come to pass. But if you will believe it, the things you speak will come to pass. And the things that God has spoken are infallible. All you've got to do is start speaking the blessing of God over you it's voice activated. These blessings are all there, but you got to speak it. And you got to speak it in faith, believing that the words that you say come to pass. And you start blessing yourself and blessing your business and blessing your kids and blessing things instead of cursing them. Bless and curse not. And you'll see the supernatural power of God come. People come up to me all the time and say, how are you? And I say, I'm blessed. Yeah. Ephesians 1, 3, I'm blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And there's people that know things have happened in my life. And they say, oh, I want to know how you really are. And I say, I really am blessed. Amen. <laughs> no, I want to know how you feel. I don't care how I feel. I say over myself what God's word says over me. And if I keep saying it, my feelings change and my experience changes. I know some of you think this is a little weird, but that's the reason that you aren't seeing it come to pass because you don't believe it. I challenge you to believe it, to understand that the blessing is God's favor spoken over you and the Bible is full of hundreds and thousands of blessings that have been spoken over you and you got to go to it and mix it with faith and then voice activate it by you speaking those things over yourself. And if you can say it, it will come to pass. Amen. Isn't that awesome? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You know, I want to give an invitation for people that don't know the Lord and don't have the baptism. We've already had something like 150 or more people receive. That's awesome. But, and I'm going to do that. But I also want to ask, there are many of you here that you realize from this message that you have been cursed. And you've cursed yourself. And you've cursed your situations. You've been using your tongue in a negative way. And you're convicted of this. Now, this may not be every person. I'm not asking you to respond if this isn't real. But if you do recognize it, man, I've cursed myself. You need to turn that around. And the way you do it is to repent. And say, God, forgive me for the things that I've said about myself, about my situation, about other people. Forgive me for cursing these people that cut me off in traffic. You say, you jerk. And, you know, it may be that they just had their wife or their husband die and they're on the way home and they just were caught up and they weren't thinking about you. It may not be malicious and yet we curse people and we say things about people that are unjust. There's some of you tonight that this isn't just a minor thing with you. It's not something that you've seen this before and you just let it slip. There are some of you that you're going this way when the word of God is saying you should be going this way and blessing and cursing not. I want to give you an opportunity tonight to repent and to change this. Faith without works is dead. It also says in 1 Timothy, he says, God will keep that which we commit unto him. No committing, no keeping. So what I want to ask is if you are one of those that say, boy, my life is going the opposite direction. This isn't just a reminder, just a little change. I have blown it. I'm, I'm hung by my own tongue. I'm, a, I'm killing myself with the words that I say. I see it tonight. I repent. And I'm going to turn around. I want to make a commitment to go in a different direction. If that's you, I want you to stand right where you are. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer that is going to reverse this and start you going in the other direction. And uh, I think that this will make a big difference in your life. If that's you, just be honest enough to stand where you are. 
If you're already dealing with this, this doesn't mean that you're perfect or that you do it perfectly because none of us control our tongue as well as we can. But if you've already seen this and if you're dealing with it, then I'm not asking you to stand. I'm asking people to stand that this is a revelation. You realize you're blowing it. You're going in the opposite direction and you need to repent. You need to turn around. Praise God. You know, if you've understood what I've said, that invitation, and if these are not people that just miss it occasionally, these are people that are hung by their tongue. You're blowing it in this area. This is a revelation and you're repenting. If you've understood that correctly, for this many people to be standing, you shouldn't have any questions about why you aren't seeing the blessings of God manifest in your life. You've answered it right here. This is enough reason right here why you aren't seeing all of the blessings of God overtake you because you're stopping it, killing it with your own tongue. So by you humbling yourself, this is a first step. And we're going to repent of this, stop these curses that you've planted. We're going to pray for a crop failure from all of the negative things that you've spoken. And then we're going to start releasing life with our words. And I believe that this could be a turning point in your life. My prayer alone won't do it. It may get you started, but you're going to have to get these truths. I encourage you to get this CD or DVD, to get teaching on this, to start having this attitude. And you're going to have to hold yourself to this. But this will change your life. I promise you, this will, this will make a huge difference. A huge difference in your life. Father, I thank you for all my brothers and sisters that have humbled themselves. They've publicly stood and said, we've blown it in this area. Father, we repent. We thank you, Father, that there is forgiveness with you. And we pray for a crop failure. We pray that all of these negative curses that we've placed over ourselves and over our businesses and over our family, over, our, over other people. Father, we just thank you that grace is being extended that we aren't going to reap what we sow in this area. Father, thank you for supernatural forgiveness and cleansing. And we make a commitment, Father, to start speaking words of life. We ask the Holy Spirit to show us the words that we should speak, to open up the Word of God, to teach us what our real privileges and blessings are. And Father, then we want to start speaking life over ourselves. Help us to get to where we honor our word so that our heart's never confused. That when we say something, we believe it. We don't say things we don't believe. Father, I just ask you to help us in this area to adopt your mindset, to come out from under this culture and the ungodly things that we've been taught and to adopt the Bible culture. Get to where we believe that the things we say come to pass. We make that commitment. We welcome the Holy Spirit to hold us to it, to remind us of this. And Father, we believe that from this night forth, we turn on those things. We turn on the negative curses. We turn on the curses that people have cursed us with. The things from childhood that have bound us and made us feel like we could never prosper. Father, thank you that all of these curses now are reversed. I bless everyone. You said when we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, you will lift us up. You spoke that. That's a blessing. That's the favor of God. I voice activate that and speak this blessing over every person. They have humbled themselves. They've admitted that they were wrong. And now we believe that you are lifting them up above this, above the poverty, above the hurt and the pain, above all of the strife, above all of the sickness and disease. Thank you, Father, that these things are broken over us and we are blessed from this time forth. No plague is coming nigh our dwelling. That, Father, we are supernaturally blessed. Whatever we set our hand unto prospers. That, Father, we are the apple of your eye. That you love us. I am my beloved's and he is mine. Your banner over us is love. Father, we speak that we are loved that we are forgiven, that we have wisdom. You've abounded towards us in all wisdom and prudence and made known unto us the good mystery of your will. Thank you that you've given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Father, we just speak these blessings and say that the blessing is trumping the curse. 
It has more power and authority than the curse. And we speak blessing now. And we say in the name of Jesus, we are prospering from this time forth, spirit, soul, and body, that we are free of the curse. God Almighty has spoken faith over us, and we are blessed. We are blessed with all spiritual blessings. We are the blessed of God. We are not cursed. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We receive it and speak these blessings in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Isn't that awesome? Have you ever heard the expression, drive a stake in the ground? You know what that comes from? I use that and a man who is an Indian in Wyoming came up and said that's an old Indian phrase. And when they saw that they were going to be beat and that there was a tendency for the people to run away, they would drive a stake in the ground and tie themselves to it so they couldn't run and they would have to fight to the death. They would not retreat. That's what that means. And you know, you need to just drive a stake in the ground and say from this time forth, I am not going to curse myself or other people. I am driving a stake in the ground. I won't move from this. I'm going to live or die right here. I refuse to go beyond this. You got to have that attitude to see this work because I promise you, you're, it's like we're in a fire right now. And because I've spoken these words and you're around like-minded people who are clapping and praising God and agreeing with it. You know, it's like being in the midst of a fire and you feel all of this heat. But when we leave here, it's like taking those little embers and taking them out and putting them by themselves. And the tendency is for you to start cooling off when you get on your own. You're going to have to fan the flames yourself. You're going to have to encourage yourself in the Lord. And this is the reason you need to get those materials. It's the reason you need to take advantage of these Bible school courses. It's the reason you need to be in a life-giving church instead of a dead church. And let me just say this. I'm not, I don't have anything to gain by this. Nobody's paying me for this. But there are some of you that go to dead, dead churches. I've been in a church one time where a guy died. They called 911 and they took out half the crowd before they found the dead person. It was dead. There are some of you that go to dead churches. They don't preach the word. It's, it's ungodly. And you wonder why you're struggling. And in a sense, you're using my program to bootleg the gospel. <laughs> you give your money and support to something that licenses homosexual, that preaches a wrong gospel, that is condemning people, that isn't setting people free. You give your money there and you go and get things from me and not just me, but other pastors, other churches, you're bootlegging the gospel. I love you. I'm not going to be able to keep you from doing it, but I would tell you that, you know what, you need to go someplace where you can find like-minded people who would build you up and edify you. You know, we have a pastor relations table out there in the back, and we have all of the pastors that attend these meetings uh, sign up and give us the name of their church and things. And I can't guarantee that every pastor that comes to this meeting preaches the same message, but that's a place for you to start looking. And we actually have a printout of all of these pastors in this area, all of the pastors who've been at the church. You go back and register with our pastor relations. You need to find one of these churches that is preaching the gospel, and you need to be where you can be built up instead of torn down. Because death and life is in the power of the tongue, not only your tongue, but every word that you hear. If you're in an unbelief church, it's affecting you. It's hindering you. When you believe one thing and yet you sit and listen to somebody preach something else, it hinders you. You need to get to where you speak the Word of God and listen to people who do speak the Word of God. Amen? So I throw that in for free. If there's anybody here that doesn't know Jesus, you must be born again. And if you are born again, but if you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which includes speaking in tongues, 
you need to receive that. We've had about 150 people receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and over a dozen people receive salvation in two services. But you know, I just don't want to let anybody go because this is absolutely essential. You cannot take what I've talked about tonight and believe without first of all believing in Jesus as your Savior. Until you do that, you can't just do this with human faith. You need to receive the supernatural gift of faith. And then you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Some of you, what I'm saying is just as foreign to you as if I was speaking in another language. And you wonder about where does he get this? Through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will teach you all things and lead you into all truth and bring to your remembrance all things whatsoever I've spoken unto you. John 14, 26. If you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of speaking in tongues, you need it. It's absolutely essential. Is there anybody here tonight who would say, I need one or both of those. I either need to make Jesus my Lord and or I need the baptism of the Holy Spirit and this gift of speaking in tongues. Anybody here like that? Praise God. We still got people. Man, this lady, she's ready. She's standing up. Isn't that awesome? Anybody else? There's people over here. Isn't this great? I tell you, God wants to fill you. God wants to set you free. I'd like to ask you if you raised your hand or if you were supposed to raise your hand but didn't do it, would you just get up out of your seat and come forward? We want to pray with you and help you to receive here tonight. Just come forward and stand right here. Let's praise God for these. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Boy, you were ready to receive, weren't you? Awesome. That's great. I like that. I like that. Boy, some people are so timid about coming forth. You know, some of you wonder, what are you going to do to me? We're going to pray for you. And we're going to give you a free book. We're going to love on you and tell you how much God loves you and do everything we can to help you to receive God's best. We aren't taking a thing from you. You're getting a free book out of it. You're going to leave with more than you came with. Somebody says, well, what if I'd come forward and nothing happens? Well, I can guarantee if you don't come forward, nothing's going to happen. You need to take a step of faith and just believe God. Anybody else here want to come and receive? Thank you, Jesus. You know, I know many of you have been here at all of the services and you've seen me go through this with these, but I think this is so important. People must know the Lord and they must receive this power of the Holy Spirit. I think that this is well worth the effort. Man, I don't mind doing it. I've done this hundreds, thousands of times and I still enjoy doing it. So anyway, we're going to pray for you. But before I can pray that you will receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and receive this gift of speaking in tongues, you first of all have to be born again. You can't receive the Holy Spirit until you receive Jesus. The Bible says Jesus is the one who gives the Holy Spirit. So you have to receive the giver before you receive the gift. Is there anybody who is not absolutely certain that you are born again and that Jesus is your personal Lord. Is there anybody here who's not sure? If you aren't, I need to pray with you first because you can't receive the Holy Spirit until you receive the giver of the Holy Spirit, Jesus. Anybody here who's not sure and you want to pray? Here's a couple over here. Anybody else? Here's one right here. Man, you were the one that stood up. I like this lady. Amen. And here's, another, here's some more. Isn't this great? You know, Jesus already paid for your sins. Jesus died to forgive your sins. It's not a question of will he forgive your sins. He did forgive your sins. The only thing that's the issue is will you accept Jesus as your personal Savior? And there's a lot of people think, well, I believe Jesus was the Son of God. That's not making him your personal Savior. The devil believes and tremble is what James 2.19 says. But the devil isn't saved. You've got to do what the devil never did, and that is you have to turn your life over. It says in Romans 10, 9, that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. 
That's more than just saying the words. You got to believe that he's your Lord. You got to turn your life over to him. Doesn't mean that you're promising I'll never do anything wrong because you can't keep that promise. But you're saying, I want you to be my Lord. I give you freedom. I want you to control my life. I'm turning my life over. You are now my Lord and Savior. And if you're willing to say that and believe it from your heart, you will be saved. Isn't that a good deal? Man, that's awesome. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And I'd like to ask everybody to pray with me because I don't want them to feel like we're just listening to them. And if you will say the words that I'm saying and mean it from your heart, it's not magic. You have to believe it. But if you will believe it in your heart, then you'll be born again. You'll become a totally brand new person. Isn't that a good deal? Y'all ready to do that? Let's everybody say this. Say, Father, I'm sorry for my sin. I believe Jesus died to forgive my sin. And I receive that forgiveness. Jesus, I make you my Lord. I believe that you are alive. That you now live in me. I am saved. I am forgiven. In Jesus' name. Amen. You believe that? Welcome to the family. Amen. You believe that, brother? Awesome. You believe that? Wonderful. You ladies over there believe that? You know, according to the Word of God, you just got changed. Now, on the outside, you're still women. This is still a man over here. But you know, on the inside, you are just a completely brand new person, and you'll spend the rest of your life trying to figure out what just happened to you. And the Bible says that in the Spirit, you are now the temple of the Holy Ghost. That means He created you for this. Those that just got born again in the Spirit, they, their Spirit is now a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. Every one of you now profess Jesus to be your Lord. And the Holy Spirit was intended to come live on the inside of you. The reason that's important is because this is what God made you for. You don't have to wonder, will he give it to me? This is what you were created for. He wants you to have the Holy Spirit more than you want to have him. Some people will say you got to be holy before you can receive the Holy Spirit. If you could get holy without the Holy Spirit, you wouldn't need the Holy Spirit. If you got problems in your life, that doesn't disqualify you. It just means you need God's power and he was wanting to give it to you. So don't let some sense of unworthiness keep you from receiving. God wants you to have the Holy Spirit. So we aren't going to beg. We're just going to ask. And we're going to believe that God's power comes in you because he wants to do it. And so we're going to ask. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And then our prayer ministers are going to come up here and stand behind you and lay hands on you. Because in the Bible, when people laid hands on other people, the Holy Spirit would come into them. It's like you can transfer this anointing and power of the Holy Spirit into other people. So we're going to, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And then these people behind you are going to lay hands on you and release the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And then after they lay hands on you, I want you to quit asking for the Holy Spirit and believe that he came. Because God said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So you don't have to beg. We're just going to ask. And then they're going to lay hands on you. And then I want you to start thanking God. And when they lay hands on you, I want you to lift your hands like when somebody sticks a gun in your back. And you go, I yield. I surrender. I want you to yield. These are like your spiritual antennas. And you just start praising God and thanking Him that He gave you the Holy Spirit. Whether you feel anything or not, you do it because His Word promised it. And you speak that blessing. Take what I talked about tonight and start blessing yourself and saying, I am filled with the Holy Spirit. I have received. And then those of us that know how to pray in tongues are going to start praying in tongues because the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 14, 17, that when you pray in tongues, you're giving thanks. Well, you're praising God in a heavenly language. And so we're going to start thanking God in our gift of tongues. And I want you just to enter in and pray with us and start thanking God in tongues. And I know you're saying, but I don't know how to talk in tongues. I got a book that will explain the whole thing, but if you're ready, you can do it right now. 
The number one problem that I experience with people, they think God's going to force you to speak in tongues. And it's not like that. It's just like when I spoke tonight. I believe God spoke through me, but he didn't force me to say it. That's the reason it came out with my sense of humor. I thought of the words. I spoke, but I believe it was inspired by God. It's the same speaking in tongues. The Holy Spirit doesn't make you speak in tongues. He inspires you. He gives you the desire, the utterance, the inspiration. But you have to start making words. You have to sound. You have to make sounds. And if you will start doing it, you'll find out it just flows out of you. It's not you. It is you, but it's the Holy Spirit inspiring it. It's just like me. I can stand up here and talk forever. Don't have any notes. You know why? Because I believe I'm being inspired by God. It's not just coming out of my brain. It's coming out of my heart. It's being inspired by the Lord. And you'll find out that it's supernatural the way that you speak. And it's more powerful than what you understand. But anyway, if you're ready, we're going to do this. And I believe that this is going to transform your life. It's going to change you. Amen? Amen. The Bible says believers will speak with new tongues. I want you to say, I'm a believer. I'm a believer. And I will speak with tongues. Father, I thank you for all of these. They are born again. Now they are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We open up the doors of our temple. And Holy Spirit, we welcome you to come in. Come into our lives. Fill us with your power. Fill us with these gifts of the Holy Spirit. This gift of speaking in tongues. We want all of you. And we want you to have all of us. We welcome you into our lives now in Jesus' name. We lay hands on you and say, receive the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. We loose this power to flow into your body right now. We release this anointing and just thank you, Father, that your power of the Holy Spirit is coming into their heart, coming into their mind, coming into their life and transforming them. Father, we thank you and we receive it in Jesus' name. Now let's put your hands up and just go to thanking God. Thank you, Jesus, for giving me the Holy Spirit. I am baptized in the Holy Spirit. I am a believer. I will speak in tongues. Those of you that know how to speak in tongues, let's pray right now. Start thanking God in your language. Start praising God. And as we speak in tongues, you speak with us. Quit speaking in English now and start speaking in tongues. Start saying words. If you don't know what to say, if you don't know what to say, you can try and say what you hear the person behind you say. But your tongue will be unique to you. It'll come out differently. But once you start speaking, don't quit. Just keep going. Just keep speaking. Praise God. You can't talk in tongues with your mouth closed. You got to open your mouth. You can't talk in tongues in English at the same time. Brother, let's pray in tongues. You know English, but when you're praying in tongues, it's your spirit praying. You speaking in tongues? You're trying. Do you understand what you're saying? Well, then it's tongues. Isn't that good? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let me have your attention here for just a minute. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I want to give you some instructions. Whether you spoke in tongues or not, I believe God gave you the Holy Spirit because he promised that he would. I believe you've got it. I have the Holy Spirit, but I'm not speaking in tongues right now because I can control it. And you know, when I first prayed and received the Holy Spirit, it took me three and a half years to speak in tongues. But that's because I was a Baptist and I had so much 
fear about it. I've been told so many things about that these are demon tongues that I just misunderstood it and it hindered me from believing. And it took me a long time, but I've renewed my mind. Now I can speak in tongues with the best of them and it's changed my life. And I've taken everything that God showed me and I've written it in a book. And I'd like to give every one of you a copy of this book free. For those of you who got born again, this book also covers what true salvation is. So it covers salvation and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You need to understand what this is about. Right now, some of you don't understand what's happening. This is more powerful, I promise you, than what you've understood. And even if you spoke in tongues, you need to know why it works and what you're doing. And this book will explain it. And if you didn't speak in tongues, it will explain to you all of the hangups I had. I don't think anybody ever had more trouble speaking in tongues than I did. And so this will answer your questions and it will help you to speak in tongues. I talked to a man out there tonight who got the book and stayed around this afternoon. He came forward this morning, didn't speak in tongues, but he got the book and read it this afternoon and was speaking in tongues before the night service. And so praise God. I believe it's going to help you. So Ashley over here is the man with his Bible up. And if you'll just follow him, we got a room right over there that he's going to take you, give you the book, answer your questions, pray for you. We want to help you any way we can so that this has a maximum impact. Hey, God bless you. Thank you. Isn't this great? Let's praise God for all of these. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. You know, I would suspect that that's another 30 or more people that receive the baptism. That's probably somewhere around 180 people in three services. Isn't that awesome? In the Bible, 120 people were present on the day of Pentecost, and they turned the world upside down. 3,000 people born again before the night was out. Praise God. We've got a tremendous thing going on here. I believe good things are happening. These are our prayer ministers. For those of you that have been here, we've done this before. But if this is your first night, these are people that have been trained. They're friends of mine. They're graduates of our Bible college. Some of them travel. Pastor Bobby Ray travels from Dallas, North Carolina. They travel from Florida to come help us. The four sites here came from Houston area someplace. It wasn't too far, but they're the ones that are on the healing journey. And uh, all of these are people that can pray. Melinda down here has a training session and teaches them how to take your authority and bless like what I was talking tonight and use your words. These are people that can pray for you. And we can cover every person that needs prayer if you will let them agree with you. You know, all of these testimonies that I read at the first tonight, the person that had the blood pressure, it went from 200 over 100 down to 148 over 80. I didn't pray for them. That was these prayer ministers. These prayer ministers are seeing great things happen. And I say these things because some people think I'm the only one that can pray. But I tell you, these people, this man right here has a supernatural anointing for healing that I don't have. And I just encourage you to come and let them lay hands on you. And if you will believe, we are going to agree and we're going to see miracles happen. So if you want prayer, if you need prayer in your body right now, if you want somebody... If your faith has been quickened and understand now that when somebody speaks the blessing of God over you, how powerful it is. And if you want somebody to come and speak the word of God over you, then I want you to come right now and let someone lay hands on you and pray with you. And we're going to believe God for miracles in this place tonight. Amen. If you need prayer, come forward right now. We've got people standing at the aisles to direct you towards a prayer minister so that you won't all just pile up and on one side. Please cooperate with them. The rest of you, you're welcome to stay and pray with us. We've been seeing some good things happen. Remember that we have a service in the morning at 10 a.m. and then tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Instead of it being 7 tomorrow night, it's 6 p.m. and that will be our final service. We have CDs and DVDs of tonight's service already duplicated out here. So please pick those up, share these with someone else, and I tell you, it'll be a blessing. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.
Thanks for coming. And we believe that all of these are being supernaturally healed in the name of Jesus.